should we talk a little bit about the languages? Well, you know, we had talked a little bit as we were as we were getting ready for this about the whole, you know, what would you say is something you should do and what you, sh you probably shouldn't do in a language. So right. if you want to start or I can. Yeah, or whichever. sure. Okay. Right, right, right. So I've been I've been mulling over this question for a few days. And I, I, I did actually allude to the fact that I think, you know, it'd be great if programming language just kind of stuck to their lane uh, and mm -hmm. kind of just had a very, very clear and distinct purpose. Rust actually, I think, has broadened its scope. It has, uh, as it's developed and matured and kind of gained confidence, I think. And one of the ways that it has done so, oh, so let's, let's, but I was thinking about the best way to express this is that if I was to, if I was considering writing a shell script, I, I would write my own little utilities that I would call in a shell script. I would like that to be, those to be written in Rust. It's fast, mm -hmm. it's reliable, it's memory efficient. But I still must say that Rust is ridiculously bureaucratic and pedantic when it wants to be. Like it's a strongly typed language, mm -hmm. which means that if you are a, it cares a lot about things like the distinction between, and I apologize for any read listeners out there who this is gonna, but let's say between, let's say a 32-bit integer and a 64-bit integer, like these are really big distinctions in Rust's mm -hmm. in Rust's eyes or mentality, uh, whereas in Python, an integer is an integer, and it turns out that in the back end, if it's too wide to be re if it's too high, like if we count over four billion, we kind of Python actually does a fun thing, which is like just promote it to the next the next right. type, mm -hmm. right? So uh, likewise, if I do division in Python. Uh, and I try to divide an integer by an integer these days, uh, right. it will coerce them both to floats and do the division in a way that is more natural to a to kind of your math, mental mathematical model. Whereas Russ will just say, sorry. Can't do that. <laughs> Can't do that. At least, at least tell me what you mean by that. Like mm -hmm, this is mm -hmm. like like you're asking me in in like from Rust's point of view they are so they are as distinct as we might think of as like a car and a bicycle right mm -hmm. like you they can both drive forward they can they, but 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 they kind of can't interoperate maybe that is a bad analogy I should think of that. so I still find myself turning to Python a lot actually and if I want to pull something down from the web and pass it as JSON and kind of like create some kind of like do kind of data munging uh, unless it's um. Unless it's really, really big, I'll typically go to Python first. And just the iteration is just so elegant. You know, generators are just so easy mm -hmm. to use. Context managers are just really delightful. I don't have to worry about things closing. You know, it's just, you know, there's just so much in Python that is there it's kind of liberating. And you've got the REPL there for you. So you can kind of play right, and experiment right, right. and those kind of conveniences don't exist in Rust. So I wouldn't use Rust if I needed something done like in the next three or four hours or something. It had a shelf life of like maybe a couple of weeks. I can lean on the convenience of Python to kind of get the job done. And if it if I kind of exceed its boundaries, like uh, if I really need the performance or the memory characteristics, then I kind of would turn to Rust for kind of those things. So does that answer your question about where I would and wouldn't use Rust? Yeah, and I, th I think to me that makes a certain amount of sense because I think uh, a systems language is is always going to be more concerned about lower level details than a, than a general purpose language and things like that. So it, it goes with what it would do, and and you know I I think I think to be fair, if I were worrying about those details, like let's say I I was trying to um, trying to do do something where I had maybe a very big project and there were a lot of a lot of people working on it and there was a lot of worrying about this thing or that thing, then you know. Python has evolved with type hints and and various other things to try and manage that a little bit, but it's it's in a way kind of playing against type. It, it right. it's it's things that are added on that are actually really almost contrary to the spirit of we had it. Whereas on the other hand, you know, you talk about a a, a lifetime of a of a day or two. I mean, I write Python scripts that are are single use, 
but mm. you know, are able Absolutely. to do things that that would take me ages to do otherwise. Where then, you know, it's like this this works. This this grabs the data. The data is dirty. I know that already. It copies. It gets it over here. It takes out the obvious errors, and then I can go ahead and do something else later. Um, that that sort of thing is a strength. But if, if you're really worried about trying to cut down on on things, I mean, to be clear, and and you know this, but I just for people listening, Python is pretty strong about its types. Yeah. But yeah, that's true. true. It's, it, it's not really strong about making sure that the same name is always referring to the same type. That is actually right. not something Python does. So that that is where you get a lot of those type errors. And yeah, I mean, they're just many, many cases where that need for precision to be enforced is not something Python is really mm. naturally going to do. You can you can yeah, use I, PyPy or a you know, type checker and you can get some of it, but it's not it's not its strength. I don't think it needs to be its strength, right? Like that's exactly why right. it didn't start that way. So um yeah and I think well actually the industry itself has has adapted and, and changed. Like with the predominance of Java and uh, and then following on, so so sort of um, C sharp, um, mm -hmm. or like the .NET kind of ecosystem, or the and the JVM and the CLR, and like objects were very very prominent, and then a tradition like a transition to a more functional style, and also there has been a a shift away, at least I've perceived a shift away from dynamic languages. Ruby, Python, Perl uh, have kind of in the general sense, and with the, with the, weirdly, with the exception of Python, I have kind of like trended away. Whereas static type of systems, you know, we you can see that from JavaScript is kind of being supplemented by TypeScript, uh, you know, type, yeah. and 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 so forth. And so, it's interesting. I I I expect that within fifteen years' time, there'll be a push, like a trend backwards towards. I wouldn't be surprised. Systems. Yeah, it's it's very difficult not to kind of you know extend your own. Uh, experience away and which is probably some cognitive fallacy but we'll do it anyway the um no. one thing that i find really helpful about rust is that it is so particular and and mm -hmm. uh pedantic or you know stuffy and bureaucratic even like i'm happy to to kind of berate the compiler it's <laughs> like it's an, <laughs> an, uh because it actually enforces some really robust engineering practices and for things that do need to run consistently and be reliable, and you want to know that you're not going to encounter a type error or a value error four hours in or overnight or what have you, or um, then it's really handy to know that that situation is impossible. And so I'm definitely prepared to put up with, with it. Uh, but, you know, going back all the way to your site, you know, back to one of the comments earlier about Rust needs to be able to be accessible. And w one of the things I think that you mentioned was that it's OK to be difficult as long as people expect it to be difficult. Or at least, you know, it's that right. expectation good of going into it. Uh, I think if people were to believe that Rust is as easy as Python, it's just faster. Right. Then I think you're, I think I think that you're likely to become disappointed quite quickly. There are some things that actually Rust is surprisingly high level and attractive. Uh, I've actually been surprised at how much I've been able to carry across. This is, mm -hmm. let's say, C, where it's all, I need to increment my own integer, like indexes and kind of manually make my way through an array and so forth. I can make use of iterators that Python um, makes so elegant in Rust, and the other thing that I really, really like about Rust that, that Python is actually bringing in is pattern matching. Uh, oh, right. I, I'm not, I'm, I, I must say, I'm suspicious about the, 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 the pattern matching proposal. I, I, uh, I don't know. I haven't checked the votes. I don't know which side of that debate you were on, Naomi. I guess I've, I've been around long enough that, that there's, there's a part of me that always goes, oh, man, no, there's something else we're going to have to think about when you read other people's code. Even if I choose not to use it, I'm still going to have to deal with this. Right. Um, there's sort of a, a text as the language increases, right? Right. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, um, I think that it's... I think that it's an interesting idea. I think that it it ultimately is probably 
not a bad idea. I I do have to admit that as as the exchanges have gone on now for I don't know six months now on the Python dev list, I've started to mute that thread as they go back and forth over the details of the semantics of matching it. I'm now at the point of please just figure it out and let me know how it turns out. Um, but but you know it's I think it's it's a capability that we we haven't had and um i think it will add flexibility and and usefulness to the language going forward you can't just stay the same i remember when python 2 was switching to python 3 say 2012 i can recall people actually even giving pycon talks about how Python 3 was going to suck the joy out of their lives as programmers because it did these things they just couldn't abide. I was like, no, that we need to move forward. So, uh, yeah. Well, I, and, and, I, and I think actually, you know, there was so much skepticism. And so uh, the Python 3 transition was, you know, not not as bad as the, like the Perl, you know. Perl 5, the, Perl 6 yeah, thing, yes. I think there were some sound technical reasons for moving to Python 3, fixing up the mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the representation of strings or uh, and being able to have kind of a, like a Unicode first um, model, I think is the right choice. And I think that yeah. uh, the core Python, you know, it's a very difficult decision to actually, and it must be weird if you were starting with Python because you came into data science and you were learning pandas and right. then you kind of we hear about this weird Python 2 version. Uh, <laughs> like like yeah. how strange would that be? Like there are so many conveniences in Python 3. Um, that is, oh, that's quite nice. I mean, it, yeah. it, it took well, me a long time to move across, I must say, but I... And, and I think I think it's. I mean, I I have listened one way or another to people from from the core team beat themselves up over the way that that was done, and I think I've come to the conclusion that they really shouldn't have. I mean, in fact, the transition went pretty much the way they predicted. If you look at the number of packages over time, it was a very straight line, and all of that. The thing that they missed was a lot of the perception issues. I think for one thing, then, and the other thing I think they completely missed was just how many people were going to need to run both as they transitioned. I think there was really a huge assumption that everybody was going to convert. It's going to be a painful year, and then we were done. And in fact, it was, of course, a a painful decade of people figuring out how to do both while they managed to mm. get things across. So yeah, it, sadly, that the two to three command just wasn't quite enough. Like. No, it it didn't. And, and now, of course, we got future and and all of these other things so that the problem is now solved now that fortunately it's it's more or less irrelevant but yeah that, that was i think the thing that that was really uh sort of the the unfortunate thing about it and of course the the people who made the decision and were sort of the face of that change got got a lot of grief for it that yeah, again as i yeah, say yeah. it was not entirely justified i don't think sure the barrier to entry for a new language feature must be very high now in python Whereas, I guess, pre Python two, it, you know, if Guido right. thought it was a good idea, then it it happened, right? Or like if someone implemented it and it seemed kind of interesting, then oh, there we go. Well, and I, and I think in the early days, it, it was largely guided by Guido's aesthetic sense, which right. I think I think in the realm of programming languages. Um, Oh, what is Guido, not not Guido, by the way? Oh, sorry, yeah, no, mm -hmm. I should um, get correct my pronunciation there. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's I, I think his 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 aesthetic sense, his artistic judgment, if you will, for programming languages is exceptional. But these days, it's it's beyond any one person. I, I know that that he feels that way, and pretty much everybody does. And so, the discussions can get can get quite quite lengthy. And um, the steering council now is doing. I think as good a job as anybody can. I'm sure that, you know, they they hear of all sorts of people disappointed with every decision that they make. But uh, I think that model is actually a sound one. Right. Yeah. The last um, Python improvement proposal that I read in depth, I think, was the at symbol matrix operator. Uh, and I was astounded at the quality of the writing and the depth of argument to, and I was just, I was just thinking about how much effort must go in 
to getting something like through the door. But mm -hmm. uh, so do you think that a language could become, let's say, like kind of topple over with the weight of becoming too big or because I don't think any language has decided to stop adding that next feature? I mean, I don't know if if they topple over, because I suppose there's always a, that core subset that it, that remains what it always was. You know, you don't have to use everything. Right. But, you know, I, I think that maybe languages can become absorbed with that and, and the new features and that sort of thing and not realize as maybe the world passes them by. Uh, so, you know, if I if you look at if you look at Pearl, Pearl never became unusable, really. I mean, no, sure. I mean, still, yeah. still some very sharp, very smart people writing some very good Pearl programs, but. It, it is no longer something that is driving much of, of it. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not the language of system administration really these days. So, no. Um, no. you know, that, that it's, uh, and I think, I think maybe it partly was is they were busy worrying about six and what they were going to do and all of those things that in fact the world decided to do something else, so. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I do think that all of the all of the languages will eventually grow old and become more or less irrelevant. I don't know if they ever die. COBOL is still out there even now. Right. But yeah, if Fortran continues to iterate.